Reel is sponsored by Total Health, one of the UK's leading wellbeing organisations committed to helping individuals, athletes and businesses build health and performance. This is Edinburgh Reel, a show dedicated to delivering compelling conversations with fascinating people. I'm Elliot Reeves and I'm joined by my co-host Craig Ali, founder of Total Health, who are sponsor of the show and one of the UK's leading health and wellbeing organisations committed to helping individuals, world-class athletes and corporations build health and performance. Today's guest is Mel Sherwood. Mel is a multi-award winning speaker, trainer and coach and the founder and director of Grow Your Potential, an, organi an organisation which specialises in supporting individuals and businesses to design and deliver win winning pitches and presentations. Mel, your background includes over 20 years experience in public, private and not-for-profit organisations in Australia and the UK, and you've also worked as an actor, presenter and singer. Mel, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Welcome to Edinburgh Real. Thank you. Welcome. Absolutely welcome. So, if you could start by setting the scene and maybe telling us a bit about your background, where you grew up and more broadly, you know, what you were like growing up. Okay, well, I grew up in Australia, in mm. uh, Melbourne suburbs, and I had a happy, normal childhood, whatever that <laughs> is. I had, uh, the suburb that I grew up in was a new suburb, so there was lots of young families and lots of kids around and that sort of thing. Uh, people might be surprised, but I was quite a shy quiet young child, <laughs> young child, I was a young yeah. child, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was quiet and I, t yeah, I, when I was about six, I discovered calisthenics, which is kind of a mixture of singing and dancing and marching and club swinging and folk dancing and various things. And mm -hmm. that really, and I, I, I did competitive calisthenics for about, until I was about 16. And that shaped, I think, a, a big part of my life in terms of where I wanted to head in terms of being on the stage and performing, really enjoyed that. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the discipline of it, and it was really um, very much team. It was all girls, and it was very much about uh, being part of a team and uh, competing. And I really enjoyed that as 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 I was growing up, and that was kind of my main interest outside of uh, school. Quite liked school when I was growing up. I was. I was quite good at it. I didn't really have to try hard. Mm. And then I realised as I got older that when school started to get hard and I had to learn things that I, <laughs> I was kind of burnt out a bit. Yeah. And I didn't know, I'd never learned how to study properly because I never had to, which just yeah. came easily to me. So yeah. while all the other kids who had tried hard all through their school years had learned how to study, when I got to sort of my middle high school years, I suddenly went, whoa, this is, I actually have to put some work in to, to make yeah. this happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I was sort of, I was not real. I was, yeah, I was, I had this, I was drawn between the creative side of me and yeah. the academic side yeah, of me. So literally took the words out of my mouth. That yeah. was going to be what I was going to say. Yeah. Very much so. And the creative side won out. Okay. So careers advisors obviously all suggest, I decided when I was sort of in my early teens that I started to think, actually this performing thing, I could do this, why, why not? Mm -hmm. And of course the careers advisors all say, oh, well, there's, you know, 97% of actors are out of work at any <laughs> one time, what do you want to do that for? Get something behind you to, to fall back on and, and my parents were advising me of that as well. Having said that, my parents were really supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Yeah. Both of them yeah. were pushed into jobs that they didn't want to do oh. when they were growing up and so they were very conscious that myself and my brother would have the opportunity mm. to choose what we wanted to do mm -hmm. and whatever choice we made, it was our decision, we had to live with it and if it yeah. worked then great and if <laughs> not then we had to suffer the consequences or work out how to manage it and so I think that was a really useful thing for me. My parents both had a really good work ethic, so I sort of had a part-time job from the time I was able to, which I think in Australia at the time it was 14 and nine months, mm. my first yeah. part-time job on the day that I turned 14 and nine months. So I really enjoyed sort of being independent and working as well. Uh, but yes, this idea that I was should, should go to university and get a degree, and the suggestion was teaching 
drama teaching and and I did get into university to do drama teaching and chose not to go. So there was a new course that I, I was involved with. I'd already done a year at this particular college and they were introducing a new course in performing arts and it was all new and exciting and, I, and I, so I went down that way. And the, the course was brilliant because it, it covered all sorts of things outside of performing but it, so we, we did makeup and costume design and lighting mm, and set mm. design and stage management and oh. all sorts of production uh, elements as well as well as circus skills and <laughs> random yeah, yeah. things that you mm. never really use in your life necessarily <laughs> unless you pursue that but it was really great grounding and allowed me to to really embrace that part of me that wanted to perform when I was yeah. younger so yeah, yeah, that's kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, excellent. And, and so was it from there that you ended up going into acting? Is it something... Yes, that, that interestingly, I, I was sort of... I finished the course and I kept putting off getting an agent until I got my teeth straightened or until I'd lost weight or until <laughs> I, you know, it was perfect to go out. Yeah, and, and then yeah. I suddenly... Something dawned on me and I thought, actually, there are all sorts of different people. You don't have to look or be a certain way so I bit the bullet and I, I, I it's really interesting because people see me as quite a confident person mm. but I had a lot of self-doubt as a as a young and, woman uh, yeah and yeah I mean you would have been young then when you were making yeah. that decision as well yeah, and I think absolutely. you know very few people at a young age are really self-assured and yeah so it's interesting because when I went to to study performing arts I probably had more confidence and they tend to kind of strip you bare and then build you back up again right, okay. so you start to question everything yeah, yeah. and so uh yeah there was there was sort of a part of me thought yes i can do this and a part of me kept putting it off and then i read the book feel the fear and do it anyway mm. and just decided to do it anyway so i bit the bullet and went mm. off and, and got myself an agent and did various sort of acting jobs but as an actor in melbourne there's not a huge amount of work around so i had to uh, make a living as well and I did so many different jobs as a, um, mm. a young woman so uh, anything I sort of the way I got myself through college I was painting designs on t-shirts for a factory <laughs> like hand, and they were able to sell them and say hand-painted designs and I was getting pittance for them and, and I had uh, my living room was always covered with with uh, t-shirts that I'd drawn flowers on and various yeah. things. I wasn't particularly artistic, but yeah. they seemed to <laughs> think they were all right. So that was really helpful because for me, because it was flexible as well. And when you're yeah. studying performing arts, you've got to be available for rehearsals and all of yeah. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but retail played a big part in my life as well. So my first job um, was in a retail shop, the bra shop, which all the boys thought was hilarious. <laughs> but <laughs> Mel, Mel was working in the bra shop. And, uh, and so, and then I sort of stayed in retail. And after I finished uh, college, I went and got a job, which I thought would be for about six months so I could save some money to pay off the, the debts that I'd acquired during college and to get my teeth straightened. <laughs> so I went off and I ended up at that company for almost 15 years and not in the same role, obviously, but mm. I had so many opportunities and very, very supportive managers okay. who said to me that they recognized that performing is what I wanted to do yeah. so they would enable me to have time off when I was needed to go for auditions or if I got a short role in in something then I would arrange my holidays around it so it enabled me to to still pay my rent and and mm. uh, pursue that that performing part of it as, as well so I was very fortunate and I had so many great opportunities in that organization as well I worked in customer relations and marketing roles mainly mm, okay. and just the and I've, I've since looked back and I thought everything that I've done in my life connects to communicating in some way with the marketing yeah, and, and yeah. it's you know it's only dawned on me in, a, in the last few years I went oh okay yeah. yeah that makes total sense why am I so passionate about communication I yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. everything that I've done is related to communication yeah. So, yeah. yeah yeah it's interesting one of the questions that I had written down actually was it's kind of like the the chicken and the egg scenario so it's like did you get into acting because of your communication or did acting actually give you the communication skills oh interesting question I think a bit of both yeah okay I think yeah I think definitely I learned how to articulate myself and and I think for me because of the performing background and this is what I share with with my clients and, and um, participants in my workshops now is 
that whole idea of it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah. And being able to use your body and your voice effectively to enhance the message mm -hmm. is key. Mm -hmm. So for me, learning those skills was, was crucial. And I, I just, I have kept developing them despite the fact I wasn't particularly academic. I am a voracious learner. I've, I'm always learning personal development and, and uh, learning as much as I can about well, the world that I work in, but outside of that as well. And is that what helped build that confidence so that you could perform? Because obviously you were apprehensive at the, at the beginning, as most people would. Yeah. Or was it just going through the course as well that really built those skills for you? Uh, a bit of both. I think it really is just getting out there and doing it, putting yourself out there, stretching mm. beyond your comfort zone. You, mm. You've heard, you know, life begins outside your comfort mm. zone. <laughs> and it really is a case of doing that. And I, I'm a, a big believer in doing that. I'm not always great at it because we all like our comfort zone. Yeah. So I, I yeah. first want to put my hand up and say that, yeah, sometimes it, it, it is hard to take that, that, yeah. that step, but it always pays off and you always mm -hmm. learn and grow from it no mm -hmm. matter what. So. 100%, you yeah. always end up being a better person than you Absolutely. were before. Absolutely, yeah. So it's yeah. always worth the, the risk, the upside so much. Better. Worth yeah. all the tears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's, a bit, there's been some tears along the way, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. So do you do any acting now? <laughs> I had it for a long time until recently, interestingly enough. I don't act prof professionally anymore, but I was invited to audition for a role in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I got the role of Martha, which is a amazing role for an actor to play and I was so grateful that I was encouraged to to audition so I've just finished that which really stretched me physically mentally emotionally it's a three-hour play with four actors so there's a lot of lines to learn yeah. and it, it's, it was a very emotional uh, role so I yeah it was it, wrung out by the end of it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm having a rest mm -hmm. again now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, sorry to, the, a little bit of interest there, have you saying it's a really emotional role? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, how do you preserve yourself in that? How do you look after yourself if you're playing a really emotional role or do you just have to give it everything? I mm -hmm. give it everything. Right. And it, it's interesting because even in, well, if, if I'm doing a talk or delivering a, training course, I give everything. That is just me. And yeah, I yeah. asked, I was at a boot camp for professional speakers a couple of years ago and I asked some of the, the other, other speakers, how do they manage their, their energy? Because I just, I just give it. Yeah. And it, one of the advice was, oh, just put your prices up and work less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's an option. <laughs> but for me, I, I don't believe in not giving yeah. my all. So, yeah. You just have to manage manage more your energy, I suppose, and do good things to to build mm. yourself up again and mm. allow yourself the time. I know my whole life has been this kind of series of up, ups and downs in relation to performing. Every time I do a role, I'm I'm so in it, and I really I give give mm. everything, mm. and it becomes my life. Yeah. And then it it ends, you have your last performance and that group of people who've worked so intensely mm. together for a period of time all go their separate ways and you may or may not bump into each other again. Uh, and quite often I get what I call post-show blues. Yeah. And actually my mum took me to a doctor when I was sort of in my uh, mid-teens thinking that I was really depressed and I, I just had no energy to do anything yeah. and and we identified that that's what it was this yeah. this post-show blues Jeez. and so now I just accept that as part of the the yeah. way my life is that I will have these highs and lows and now I allow myself to wallow in self-pity and and have these post-show blues and <laughs> until I'm ready to do the next thing and this time it, it, it was short and I, I sort of went oh yeah that's that's that show over what am I going to do now? And I was right into the next one. But sometimes I'll just take time out and, and not, not do anything for a while. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So because the way you describe that there, and as everyone then just disappears and goes, goes away, it must feel like a small percentage of grief and, of course. and loss. Yeah. And obviously it, you, it's not yeah. the same as losing a loved one Absolutely. or whatever, but in a way you, you, you do, do get those same feelings, aren't you? Yeah because it is, it's very intense. You work very closely, you get to know these people or you get to know their characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you, yeah, you, you've, you've created something together and then it's gone. 
And mm. I know I, I sung in a, a 60s tribute show for about five years in my 20s, and it was probably the best job I've ever had. I loved it. Uh, you know, dressing up in beehive wigs and false eyelashes and lots of feathers and sparkles and I, I, and touring around entertaining people. It was yeah. brilliant. And But what was more brilliant about it was the, the two girls that I, I worked with and I we just had such a great relationship. And when that ended, mm. it, it, we were all at different times in our lives and it was just the right time for it to, to mm. end. But it took a long time to kind of fill that that void mm. That, mm. That, that left. So... It is just a case of allowing it. it, it that's what life is, I suppose. Mm, yeah, you you mm. have these people come into your lives and out of mm. them, and the ones that you really um, bond with and you want to keep in your life, then you will. Mm. And, and mm. I have. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So it'd be really interesting to hear your, your journey in coming to the UK and how you ended mm. up. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So as a as a, a, a young woman. Unlike many Australians, I didn't pack my bags and go backpacking when I was younger. Okay. I did it when I was 35. <laughs> and I, I had had kind of a few significant changes in my life and thought, right, I'm just... When I was younger, it was I didn't want to take time out of the acting scene because yeah. you, you spend so much time building up the relationships with yeah. the casting people and that sort of thing. So I, th I didn't want to take the time away then. But at 35, I was ready for an adventure. And so I, I quit quit my job and packed my bags and sold everything or stored it and I was planning to be away for probably nine months or so in total uh, I traveled first to America and then around uh, traveled around uh, Western Europe and then came to the UK and I, I have an ancestry visa so I was able to work here otherwise I would have been too old mm. to get a work visa mm. so I was fortunate that I could work here and I thought I'll get a job for six months and save up enough money and then travel back via Africa and I've still not been to Africa so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was and it, it was the Edinburgh Fringe Festival that drew me to Edinburgh as and I ended up I moved moved here and with the intent of working somewhere involved in the festival mm. and I, I did work for the Fringe office for about nine months or so uh, in the first year that I was here and and then just fell in love with Edinburgh as you do. Yeah, I, I had yeah. no intention of of being here. I, I hadn't even thought about moving to Scotland, <laughs> but it just felt like home for some reason, and, yeah, it, yeah. and it has been home ever ever since. So that's yeah, eleven years ago now. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's how I ended up here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so what was the nature of the work that you were doing when you arrived and, and what sort of jobs have you had? Oh, since? okay, yeah. <laughs> so my first job, the, the day I arrived, oh, well, I, when I arrived in the UK, I didn't, I didn't come straight to Edinburgh and I worked in a pub in a little village mm -hmm. in England. And I, I had met up with a pen friend who I'd written to since I was 11. So we had <laughs> a sit and we were both... You know, mid thirties. So uh, we we met once when we were eighteen, and she came to Australia. And so I I stayed with her for a period of time. I was planning just I'd sent a box of work clothes because I wasn't going to carry them around in my backpack. And so I'd sent a box, and I went to pick up my clothes, and I thought I'll spend a few days with her. I ended up spending about four months there. <laughs> <laughs> I was exhausted. I'd been partying really hard yeah. uh, during my travels, and I didn't know what I was going to do or where I was going to live. So I was applying for jobs, and she was brilliant. She was. I'm so grateful for her, you know, allowing me to stay. And then I got a job in the the part uh, part time job in the local pub, and I was doing a bit of uh, waitressing at, at Blenheim Palace and various other places and uh, random things. And then I. I eventually met, bit the bullet and, and moved to, to Edinburgh and got myself a temp job. I think it was Scottish Widows doing some kind of data entry. Mm. And then I, a few weeks after that, I had a job at the Fringe. So I worked in the program production and then moved into advertising and sponsorship. And yeah, and that was that kind of sowed the seed for me in terms of doing my own one woman play, which I then did in 2008. Uh, but after the fringe office, I went and worked for uh, the Church of Scotland. So you could not get two more extreme mm, organisations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, that was only going to be temporary as well. And that ended up for six years. And I had brilliant <laughs> opportunities there. And that's when I moved into learning and development and training. Okay. And realised that, oh my goodness, this kind of combines everything that I've done in my past. Mm, and yeah. 
it, it felt really right. So I knew I was, I was on the right path in terms of what I was going to do with um, cool. the next part of my life. It wasn't quite there because I had always wanted my own business. So yeah. that's why I left that job. But anyway, we're not up to that yet, are we? <laughs> I'll not jump the gun. <laughs> <That's, that's laughs> must, must be so difficult as an actor, though. I mean, you've fully committed to that because that's what you're passionate about. Like you say, you put everything into it. And it is so up and down. And then if you fall away from acting, it's what what do you mm. then have to pull? Well, you obviously have a lot of skills you can, yeah. but you've got to be really yeah. uh, really switched on and precise to how you're going to use those. Yeah. And I think skills. in hindsight, I I didn't make that commitment. I know other people who, who didn't go off and get jobs in other industries. They just stayed on the doll and, and okay. pursued that acting yeah. career. I'm really, in hindsight, I don't think I was... In, I didn't have the hunger that I needed to really succeed mm, a, as an mm. actor, and I, you know I got bits and pieces of work and and uh, had some great great experiences and opportunities. But having the opportunity to work with a, a large organisation in various different roles and learn all sorts of other skills involved in mm. in, in well in business, I suppose, mm. but the communication and just all sorts of things that a lot of people wouldn't have. The opportunity to do mm. and I'm so grateful it's just I think it's all just combined to enable me to to have the, the skill set that I do now mm. which is great <laughs> really pleased about that <laughs> yeah have you always been aware of your skills uh, when you say aware of my skills in terms of what, what are you referring to yeah like in terms of uh, I suppose like an awareness of I'm really good at communicating I'm really good at getting on with people I'm really good at and then it all kind of culminating in what is now your your own business. Is this, is it, I suppose what I'm trying to get at, is it things that you have personally been aware of or is it more people have said you're, oh, you know, I've noticed that you're really good at that? Mm. I think it was a maybe a gradual awareness. Mm. I, I never used to think that I was creative. Okay. But I think in my head when I was quite young I just assumed that creative meant you could draw or paint <laughs> and I've realized yeah. that I am actually incredibly creative and it, it drives me and if I'm not creating then then there's mm. something missing mm. in 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 my soul so mm. uh, it, it, it it took took me a while to kind of realize that I think uh, this the skills that I have I just yeah I, I think for me I just jump in and whatever I need to learn I learn I'm quite flexible and adaptable which is um, uh, I think that's one of my probably best skills actually to be able to to turn my hand to anything mm, and just mm. jump in and, and do it and find out if I don't know how to do it I'll find out how to yeah. do it find mm -hmm. someone else who knows mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. cool so your your own business now grow your potential yes um, how did that come about what was the you know how did you get to that stage where you thought I'd like to start my own business and this might be a good idea for my own business. I had always wanted my own business but didn't know what it was going to be. And I, my partner and I came up with an idea uh, for a business and decided that we would, we would give that a go. And it was an online platform for the performing arts industry. So nothing to do with Grow Your Potential. Mm. And I was fortunate to get a, a place uh, with Entrepreneurial Spark and so I went, pitched the idea and, and went in there and very quickly realized that that wasn't for me. It, a, it mm. was, probably was not going to make much money and B, it was not using my skills and I just didn't have the drive mm. To, mm. to do it. At the same time, I, I had always in the back of my head thought if that didn't work, then I've really enjoyed working in learning and development and I could potentially <laughs> see myself uh, working in a, a training company. And around the same time as, as working in learning and development, I started learning how to speak in public. I had to design and deliver a presentation skills course uh, in my learning and development role. And I thought, oh, I better go and find out how to do this. <laughs> so mm -hmm. off I went. Of course, the standing up in front of people wasn't, wasn't as problematic for me. Having said that, standing up and speaking as yourself versus a character yeah, in a role that yeah. you're playing is, is a different mm -hmm. thing. So I went to Toastmasters and I really enjoyed that. I think it's a brilliant organization, really supportive and encouraging for, for people who are wanting to improve their communication and leadership skills. And I've, I just happened upon, you go through this program at, at Toastmasters and I happened upon one of the, the uh, exercises that I had to do in the, in the manual 
it just turned out that I wrote a really good speech that was kind of a universal message. And I entered it into a competition and I won uh, the competition and I, and I won and I represented um, Scotland and Northern England over in Ireland for um, this competition. And I started to think, oh, actually, I'm okay at this. <laughs> that was quite fun. I uh, hadn't really thought about it as that that would be what my business was. But then when I was at Entrepreneurial Spark and this business idea wasn't working and I had, I thought, okay, what was interesting is that despite the fact that my business idea was pretty rubbish. I kept winning pitching competitions because I was good at expressing this and, and, and articulating the business. And a lot of people were asking me for their for help and how could they improve their pitch. Yeah, yeah. And I realized that that's really where my strengths lie. I'm quite good at, at and particularly if, you're, if you've only got a minute to pitch your, your business, mm. you've got to be really economical with your words. And so I, I, I found that I was actually quite good at that. And, and then obviously good at helping people really believe in themselves. Because a lot of the problems that people have when they're standing up in front of people is, is just getting over that angst of having people look at them and, and, and starting to believe in themselves. And I, I had um, become a, um, an NLP practitioner as well. So that really, the, the, the tools and techniques that I now use with clients, uh, a lot of it's based on NLP. And I have, it, it's such a joy to really help people who have allowed this fear of public speaking for their whole lives, mm. to impact their whole lives, to mm. help them say goodbye to that and mm. to get up in front of people mm. is just, mm. I feel so blessed when I'm, in, I'm doing that kind of work with folk. Yeah, so anyway, yes, yeah, so I kind of was <laughs> getting to where, yeah, how, how did I come to set up Grow Your Potential? So yes, eventually I decided, okay, the other business wasn't working and I, I was, yeah, I had the opportunity to, to uh, pitch in front of um, a room full of people and it, it really, uh, yeah, it grew, grew from there. I had been working with, with people and it's, it's just grown organically. Did the penny just drop one day when you were pitching, do, do you think? or what was... I think when I realised that this was where I needed to go with it, it was actually during the NLP course that I was doing and I had a limiting belief that I wasn't in touch with my intuition. And during that course, I realized that I was in touch with my intuition. I realized I didn't want to do the other business. And so that, that was very clear. Yeah. But then I was like, well, give me a sign. What am I meant to be doing? And it, it, you know, it, it became sort of quite clear over, over the, the next sort of few weeks. So I went, oh, <laughs> hello. Here, here this, this combines everything that I'm passionate about. And mm -hmm. so I, am, I, I do feel really blessed and grateful for you to be able to do that and combine mm -hmm. everything that I enjoy. So. Yeah, yeah. It would be interesting to hear a bit about the, um, what's it called, uh, Spark? Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Spark. Spark. Entrepreneurial yeah. Spark. Um, you've been through that as well, is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. So what's that process look like and, and how has it helped you? Uh, well, what it looks like I don't know now because it's changed. They were a startup really at the, mm -hmm. at the time as well, so they're, they're changing. But it really is all about giving people the, the, um, the mindset and, and the skills to be an entrepreneur and the behaviours, uh, eSpark's very much about go do, so just take action, get out there and do it. But it was mm -hmm. good, the program gave me a great insight into uh, the importance of knowing your numbers in business and mm -hmm. uh, um, building networks. And I think, and just, I was, I found it inspiring because of, there were so many people who had such brilliant ideas and so passionate about it. Um, and. It's one of the things that keeps driving me, actually, because I do come across people who have brilliant ideas and they're, they're great at what they do, but they're not so good at expressing that to other people. Mm -hmm. And so if I can help them to, to get that message across, then they're going to be far more successful because if you can't communicate clearly and confidently what it is that you do, whether you're in a, a business for yourself or not, if you're an employee, you're going for a job interview, you've got to be able to clearly and confidently mm -hmm. uh, speak to people and yeah. if you if you are, can't show that you're confident then no one's going to have any confidence in you and mm -hmm. it's kind of a bit of a, a catch-22 for people so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what are some of the techniques that you actually use in helping people become better at speaking and pitching uh, it depends on on the person and when if people come to me individually for co for coaching then I will 
get an understanding of, of what what their their concerns are. Some people, it's really all about I'm a petrified. I can't stand in, in front of people. Mm -hmm. So it's about un uncovering that. And um, I've got there's a great exercise that I do around limiting beliefs that really helps people move from one belief to another and sort of I think there is this thing about affirmations and people always talk about oh say the affirmation in you know I am a millionaire or whatever mm -hmm. it is that people mm -hmm. want but I think you it really needs to resonate with you yeah. mm -hmm. and it, so I help them kind of change the words around so if they don't feel confident saying I'm a confident public speaker then then we get to the point where they can say I'm on my way to being a better okay. speaker so yeah. or we we'll word the, the language around something that resonates and I really make sure that people so you feel it has to be realistic to where the, the, the their thought process yeah because otherwise point. it's too big a leap okay uh, sometimes and we do this in the exercise that I do where I, I get them to sort of stand there and start with their, with their I, what they don't, so they might say, I don't believe I'm good at speaking in public. Mm. And I ask them if they could doubt that. And most people can go, mm, okay, yeah, maybe I could doubt that. And so then, then I ask them to, to step into an imaginary circle of, of doubt and, and then think about a new possible belief. So they step into a new possible belief and they might then say, I believe I can be great at public speaking. But the whole point of it is is i, I read them like you can see when they when it's resonating when it's mm. that you know mm. if they believe that or not and so mm. it's about mm. uncovering that and and helping them understand okay so what is it that's stopping you believing that fully mm. and then you kind of unpack along the way and and mm. it may it might take a while sometimes it's short sometimes it's longer but yeah. the actual uh, physical aspect of of doing it, it's a standing up exercise so you're walking and it, it helps people sort of say goodbye to the, they don't want to go back there. Once they've taken a few steps forward into the new way of thinking, they don't want to go back there. And uh, so that's, that's really good. Um, mm -hmm. There's some other techniques as well in terms of anchoring confident feelings and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, those, those two are, are, are two that I use with a lot of folk. And that's if they come to me with, with concerns about standing and speaking in, in mm. front of people. Other people will come to me because they uh, don't know how to structure something or, they're, yeah. um, or they just don't know what to do with their hands, <laughs> which is <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> has a struggle with that. <laughs> so I help them on all aspects of design and delivery. How holistic does a process have to be if you have someone with real confidence issues, how much of the, the background do you have to start uncovering? Mm. You know, if they're just getting that sticking yeah. point. Do you I don't really, really need to... any of it. Okay. And I'm very conscious that I don't want people to feel uncomfortable or feel like they have to share their deepest, yeah. darkest yeah. things. People do have, somehow, have they do just open up to me. So I do have people mm. sort of sharing with me uh, the, the, what they think it stems from. and. You know, it's just so sad when s someone says, I've been avoiding public speaking since I was four years old mm -hmm. and it's impacted my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I came across a guy uh, who was going into property uh, development because he knew the next stage in his career would mean he had to do public speaking and he didn't want to. So he was completely changing this career that he loved uh, to go and do something different because he knew the next step would be having to speak in public. And I thought, just what a shame when it's so yeah. it is quite easy to to overcome it and sometimes yeah. it, it can yeah. be in a session that people will, will just go oh okay yeah i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm good mm. with that now yeah. uh, and then it's about helping them and supporting them and encouraging them to just take those baby steps and whatever that might be for them yeah yeah one of the statistics that you share in a couple of the videos that i've watched actually is that around 75 percent of the population have a fear to some degree of public speaking which is just incredible so what do you think is the the factor that people are what is it they're scared of i think it's scared of being judged <laughs> scared right. of losing their place mucking up making a fool of themselves mm -hmm. uh, we all all have fear of not being liked or not being loved. So it, it, all of that feeds into it. A lot of people, it, it, it comes, they're okay talking in, a, in, a, in a, a small group, but it's when they stand up and they feel everybody's eyes on them. Mm. Just being in the spotlight mm. is really uncomfortable for some people. Mm. Uh, and so it's a case of helping people get, get over that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And really, I like to say that 
public speaking, it, it, you're not talking to an audience, you're still talking to individuals. Mm -hmm. I have a conversation mm -hmm. with you, I have an exchange, and mm -hmm. then in the, I turn to another part of the audience and I make mm -hmm. eye contact and I have a conversation with you. And then I might talk to someone a bit further back. And so the, it's just a series of one-to-one -one conversations. And when you can help people understand that, that it's not this whole big audience, then it's, it, it's easier, I think, for people to, to approach it. So. I think that's fantastic. That's a, yeah, that's that's a truly a beautiful way of yeah. it. I've, never, I've honestly never heard it described in that way. Yeah. It makes so much sense mm -hmm. when you hear it like that. And it, it made me think a few times when I was presenting and um, with the Q&A, you almost go into a different tone. It's just like I'm speaking to you. Yeah. And, you, you know, just because it is zoned in in a kind of one-to-one -one situation there, and that just highlighted that, that yeah. process. Yeah. So, and I mean, I sometimes you see too. people who are, are, are great at, at pitching or presenting and then they fall apart at the Q&A. Mm. Other times you see people who really struggle through their presentation, yeah. but they come alive during the Q&A. Mm. And ideally you want, you want to be, be good at both. But just, yeah, just thinking about the fact that it is really just a, a series of one-to-one -one conversations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's the challenge that I, I think public speaking has certainly changed over the last probably 20 years or something, and it's less formal. People like that conversational yeah. style. Yeah. The TED Talks have really changed mm. the way we, mm. we uh, expect speakers to be. And so... I think that makes it makes it easier for, for some mm -hmm. people. Some people enjoy a big audience where there's lots of lights and they can't see the audience. <laughs> Other people, uh, you know, prefer that just kind of easy casual. Mm -hmm. So I've been on and off reading the book uh, Talk Like Ted. Yep. <laughs> and it's got some great tips in there. What 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 do you think makes up a, a great speaker? Ooh. What Sorry, I've put you on the spot. With That's that okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few things. In terms of engagement, it's about being interested and interesting. So really connecting with people. Um, but the only way you can really do that is to understand them. So knowing your audience is absolutely key. Mm. You speak differently to a group of five-year-olds to a group of 80-year-olds, for example. And your message might be the same, but the way that you deliver the message is going to yeah. be different. So it's really key to know know your audience first. And then being yourself, but the best version of yourself. And I know for me, I'm, I'm quite, um, I use a lot of gestures and <laughs> when I'm generally <laughs> talking. So, which is why I'm kind of clasping my hands here so that it doesn't go all over the place. Uh, but that's my natural style and I need to be careful that that's, that's not distracting. But it's probably quite a theatrical, it, it's yeah, probably acting. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And actually when I was younger and I was starting to do television work, they said to me, you're too big for TV. And it's right. because my, I was so animated <laughs> and when there's a yeah. close up on your face and you're making this big face, it just, when really, you, I mean, the brilliant... Uh, um, Film actors, they can just literally raise an eyebrow a millimetre yeah, and they, they communicate so much. Whereas ah, for me, I'm just yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I know I've gone a little bit, a bit off track, uh, but thinking about just bringing some energy to it. Sometimes people, I've had people in my, my courses where we film them and they think that they're giving all this energy and then they look back and they see it's quite flat. Yeah. And then it really helps them understand how much more energy you need to give yeah. when you're uh, in front of an, yeah. an audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. and is that because the, a lot of people will feel that nervous energy fluttering away or overtaking them that actually it stilts them a little bit with their performance or? It could be, yeah, it, it could be. Uh, and uh, interesting, you just mentioned that nervous energy too. And I know we, we talked before about the, um, about nerves and, and I th I, it, nerves are so normal. You know, they're natural, they're, I think nerves mean that you care. Mm. If you did, weren't nervous, you wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't really care. And there's a great phrase, I don't know who came up with it originally, but everybody gets butterflies, but the professionals get them to fly in formation. <laughs> and it, it's really just yeah. about how to manage your nerves, how to yeah. use them. And I use that energy, and I think that's one of the things that I learned from my performing background, is how to use that nervous energy to my advantage and yeah. to benefit the audience mm. versus allowing it to cripple me. Yeah. 
Having said that, I've had many times when I have let it cripple me. And um, I know we were talking before about singing and singing was one of the things that I feel the same way about singing as, as a lot of people feel about public speaking, where I do get crippled with fear sometimes. And I've, I've, I have, yes, shed lots of tears. <laughs> I've come off stage crying. I've, I, you know, I still make myself do it, but it's not gonna be the greatest performance when you're battling yeah. tears and you've got yeah. these mm -hmm. negative thoughts bombarding your head. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, once again, it's, it's getting out of my comfort zone and, and, and just keep pushing and, and building, building that confidence in there really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, that, it's that inner narrative, the negative talk. And I was recently watching um, a video by a gentleman called Russell Dalgleish, who's going to be coming on the show. And he said that there was a, I think it was a woman that he had worked with and she named the head, uh, sorry, the name, the, the voice in her head, she named it Mickey Mouse. Yep. <laughs> so every time it spoke, she was like, she yeah, Mickey Mouse yeah. discredits the and voice. And if you and hear it's like, it's it in nonsense. Mickey Mouse voice, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can't take it seriously, can you? Yeah, so yeah, 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 that's a good, that's an interesting way to do it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what are credibility killers? Ah, so you, you're talking about, I, I ran a workshop. Hopefully and, we've not just come out with a yeah. stack of them in this show. Okay, I, mean, I ran a workshop called Credibility Killers and How to Avoid Them. And it was originally uh, designed for entrepreneurs who were out there selling themselves. And, and really, uh, sometimes people think about you know credibility as being you know, doing what you say you're going to do or uh, some people will uh, assume that because you have a certain qualification <laughs> or level of expertise that you're credible but there are all these non-verbal cues and language patterns that can sometimes undermine our credibility without us being aware of it mm. uh, so i look at five areas that that impact on credibility and the first one is attitude which underpins everything mm. so if you uh, go in with a positive professional attitude, it's going to be very different to if you go with a, a, a nervous, nervous negative attitude. That's mm -hmm. going to impact everything. So the, the, the things that it impacts, it impacts your image. So how you present yourself, what you wear, how well groomed you are, that sort of thing. People make judgments about us all the time based on how we look. And it's not nice, but it is what happens mm -hmm. and so we have to be aware of the messages that we are communicating by the way we, we present ourselves so image is one of them body language is another obviously you know tall straight open body language is is much more credible than than your nervous energy and your your, your slouch and your fiddling with things you know it gives a message our bodies are communicating all the time so yeah. it's about being aware of what you want your body to be communicating yeah. uh Voice, the tone of our voice. Once again, people make judgments about us based on our voice. They can tell how well educated we are, perhaps, or how confident we are, how powerful we are based on, on our voice, how interested we are. If we speak in a monotone, we don't sound very interested or interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> if we speak too quickly, people feel like we don't care. And uh, so it's there's yeah, the, our voice has a, has a big impact. And then the words and phrases that we use. So, oh, I'm just the administrator, or I'm just this, or, uh, rather than uh, uh, saying, I don't know, phrases like, I think that'll be all right, rather than, I'm certain I can help you. So just understanding the language yeah. that we use that can undermine yeah. our credibility yeah. without us realizing. Yeah. So the workshop kind of covers those, those elements and explores that in a bit more depth. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So what do you think you would be doing if you hadn't set up Grow Your Potential? Ooh, what would I be doing? I don't know. I feel like this is the right place for me to be at the moment. Yeah. And I am someone, I get bored very quickly. So mm -hmm. I like to be changing, even though, I, like I said, I was with that company for 15 years. I worked sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time. I worked in so many different roles within the company because every 18 months or so, I, I, once I'd learnt it, I'd be on to the next thing. I'd want to, want to do something mm. different. And so for me, I think this is exactly where I need to be in my life at this point in time. Are there other things that I would like to be doing? Yes, potentially. I think but I might be, I don't know, volunteering in a third world country or something. You know, there are there are certainly things that I I would like to be doing and will be doing at some stage, but 
right now, I think this is where I'm meant to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what is it then about being an entrepreneur that you really enjoy as opposed to working within a, an organisation? <laughs> it's, <laughs> for me, it's the freedom. I'm, that is one of my values. I really value my freedom. And I've never been great at, at nine to five. I don't work effectively in the mornings. I'm a real night owl and I like to be able to work when I am at my best. Mm -hmm. So that the restrictions of being... Interestingly, I don't think many people work good nine to five. No, I, really? I have to go into organisations that are set up that way. Yeah. And yeah, I just think it, it wrecks the flow of, of the majority. Yeah. Not all, but the majority yeah. of what I see. Sorry to interrupt. That, no, that's no, absolutely fine. And I remember I, I, I have had worked in an office that had flexible working mm. hours so you could work sort of 10 till 6 or 9 mm. till 5 or mm. whatever but my boss didn't really support it for the the role that I was in and I kept saying to him do you realize you'll get so much more out of me if you allow me to start at 10 and finish at 6 because yeah. it'll be mm -hmm. the hours between 3 and 6 when everyone else is slumping that I'm, yeah. I'm starting to really <laughs> fire up yeah. so part of that for, part of it for me is is yeah the freedom and and just um, the challenge I love the the challenge of of um, of being an entrepreneur, I suppose. Having said that, am I an entrepreneur? I don't know that I have <coughs> the same kind of vision and drive as other entrepreneurs who are building massive companies. Mm -hmm. And it was quite interesting when I was in, in my journey with Entrepreneur at Spark, that their focus was on scaling the business and creating jobs and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was, it really wasn't sitting right with me. I didn't feel mm -hmm. like that was where I wanted to go with with my business and I had the opportunity to have a one-to-one -one with Anne Glogue and we were talking about my business and what my strengths are and what I enjoy doing and that is the interaction with people the coaching the training the speaking and I, I was thinking the more the bigger company I, I create the less of the stuff that I'm really good at I will be able to do and the yeah. things that I enjoy yeah. and she was great. She sort of said to me, well, she said, you just need to decide what it is that you want. And she said, because you know what, when you start to build a company, you just get tied up with all that management stuff. <laughs> and it was just, it was so refreshing to hear that. Yeah. And it yeah. really helped me rethink, <clears throat> okay, this is, it's my business. I can do what I like with it yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and shape it to suit yeah. what, what I want for me. So, uh, you know, some people would not, not, classify me as an entrepreneur as such but there there are entrepreneurial elements of what yeah, <laughs> within me i mm, suppose yeah yeah um i said this to you earlier and i'm going to say it again it's it's amazing watching you you speak and the videos that i've seen as well at how fluid you speak and how few irritators is what i would tend to call them things like uh uh or even saying things like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you seem to have very few of these. So how have you been able to train yourself to weed them out, shall we say? I'm, it's a work in progress because I, I know that there are certain certain words that I do throw in and we, we talked about like before, I know, yeah, and yeah, especially yeah. with um, if I'm around people who are using that kind of language, then it, it does slip into my vocabulary. It really is a case of becoming aware. And Toastmasters was, was great for it uh, in the particular club that I was involved with, uh, still am, but rarely get a chance to attend now, but they have a buzzer. <laughs> uh, someone is the <laughs> R counter and they buzz you and they count all the ums and ahs and other filler words. Uh, there we go, an R. See, we start to become really aware of it. <laughs> and now we're going to be sitting over here and you'll be like, yeah, one, two, yeah. <laughs> Being assessed. I'm not <laughs> saying words. That's me bailing out now for the rest of the show. <laughs> It's really interesting because I was running a course and, mm. and I, I was explaining this and so then the, the participants mm. got cheeky and they were buzzing me every time I, I said a filler word or an um or an ah uh, <laughs> and it was really uncomfortable. I couldn't even speak. <laughs> <laughs> so but it, um, so they, they will buzz you and it's, it's uncomfortable and it throws you but it really helps you become aware of it and that's what it is. It's, it's becoming aware and then pausing is the key. A pause is fine. But what we tend to do is um, to fill fill the pause. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, I was reading some uh, something the other day that talked about how important ums and ahs are yeah. in that this 
it allows us to gather our thoughts and, and yeah. lets people know that we're about to say something important as well. Because so. I suppose how, how much of it is scripted and how much of it's natural again, isn't it? I suppose it's uh, like when you're an actor, mm -hmm. uh, you have your scripted lines, but you're not performing as if you're delivering scripted lines. It's got to be part of you coming out yeah. in this character. So yeah. there's real fine art to that, isn't yeah. there? And I, it is just a case of practice, practice, practice. And we do know that too many ums and ahs are distracting, as you said, or an irritant. The ums and ahs are another credibility killer. They can make you sound really uncertain. Yeah. And you don't want to be coming across as uncertain. So mm -hmm. eliminate them, I say. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And so on that note, what advice would you give to somebody that was looking to significantly improve their communication skills? Ooh. Do you, uh, when you're talking about communication skills, are you talking about general interaction? More, yes, just more broadly. Yeah. What, what are the main things that you would suggest people focus on? Being present. Yeah. Mm. Not uh, being fully in that moment, mm. listening, proper active listening is, is the key. Um, you've heard the, the phrase, we've got two, two ears and one mouth because we're meant to listen more than we talk. And I don't think I have heard have that. Have you not heard that? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a nice way to think about it. So the more we listen, uh, the more, more we learn, obviously. But the listening is key. And what happens is that people don't listen in the moment. They're thinking about what they want to say. Or, and so it's really the challenge is to be fully present. And I learned a great tip actually that I use when I if I'm in a networking event or there's lots of distractions around me and I really want to focus on on one person and and what they're saying and really listen I press my tongue to the roof of my mouth just behind my my top front teeth and it's stop apparently I don't know the science behind this but apparently when we're thinking our, our tongues are making these little micro movements as if we're saying what we're thinking. Uh -huh. And so by pressing the tongue to the roof of the mouth, it stops those micro movements and it helps us focus. So I really like that tip. There's a tip for you. Yeah, <laughs> are nice. you trying it now? I am, yeah. <laughs> Can you see me? I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that just might work. That's, uh, because when you said that, I could feel my tongue going. <laughs> 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 Process all of yeah. this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So listening and being present are, are key. And, um, in terms you could of be a marriage counsellor with that kind of advice yeah. as well, couldn't <laughs> you? Yeah, You're going to save so. a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that would be my top tip, I suppose. Excellent. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> cool. So the 75% the of the, the public who have some element of fear, what about the sort of 5% that are verging on paralysis when they speak? What what can you do, or what do you do to help them overcome that? Uh, start your sentence with an R, ah, Mel. That's a real credibility <laughs> killer, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Thinking about going back to what we were talking about before, and the and the exercises that I I do with people, and uh -huh. it really is a case of just stretching beyond the the comfort zone, and it might yeah. be having having the courage to, to put your hand up if there's an opportunity to, to ask a question in a, in a group setting. Sometimes people have, are too scared to do that. It may be attending a, 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 a course or a, a coach. Hypnosis is another thing. People, okay. people uh, use hypnosis as various techniques, EFT and a whole lot of different ways to, to really uh, work with someone but for me it's very much about the individual and having uh, uncovering what what it is and what it what it needs mm -hmm. but doing it is is key you cannot get better at public speaking without doing it you mm. can't think about it yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. more you think about it it's not going to improve mm -hmm. so you've really got mm -hmm. to get out there and do it and find a safe and supportive environment do mm -hmm. do it little little steps at a time mm -hmm. someone i know recently her, her first presentation she did. She co-presented with someone, so she knew there was a bit yeah. of backup there. If she forgot what she was going to say, the other person could chip in and help her out. And that was. A, <laughs> is that why you do it? <laughs> so we look at each other like that every so often. <laughs> you next. <laughs> yeah. So that, that would be my advice. Baby steps. Yeah, yeah. that's really good advice. Yeah. Great.
Mm. So it would be really good at this stage to talk about some of your, I suppose, success secrets. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it sounds ominous, right? <laughs> so the first one that I have for you is who or what inspires you? Who or what inspires me? Uh -huh. I don't have one person that inspires me. I am inspired all the time by lots of different people in lots of different ways. In particular, I think it, it is people who are just doing what they are good at and what they love doing. I learn so much from so many different people. I think parents are pretty amazing, particularly mothers who are building businesses and managing families, and uh, so they inspire me. Uh, children inspire me, other people that I, I meet inspire me, but people really who are being true to themselves and living the life that they're meant to live, that's quite inspiring for me. Mm -hmm. I suppose that ties back into your, your intuition and really following that because mm -hmm. we get very uh, kind of conflicted or, or caught between head and heart. Oh yes, we do, we do, we <laughs> yeah, do, we yeah. do. And I'm working on a new keynote speech at the moment which which looks at that and how we we sometimes do di get so disconnected from our truth. And if, if in my case, that was something to do with something that someone said to me when I was, was younger about my ability to sing. They said, you'll never be a singer. <laughs> and of course, I've carried that around my entire life. Yeah. And it, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a case of, of not allowing those voices of your past to become the voices of your heart. You've got to, got to get in touch with the true, true voice and the true, true self, which is a work in progress for me. Mm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. For most people, I suppose. It's for most, isn't yeah. it? It's a yeah. continual, I don't think you ever stop developing, for That's instance, it, or yeah. becoming more self-aware. Yeah. Good. What are some of your, um, your positive habits? Do you, do you read? Do you exercise? What do those sorts of things look like in your, you know what? Is this the time when I could be truthful or, or <laughs> I could just kind of spin it a bit? Be, be, true, be true to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Just throw it right back at me there. <laughs> Inspire others so, with it. So the things that I should do are different to the things that I do do. I am very much about, about I love going for a walk. That's one of my key things. It's when I, I, I kind of reconnect with myself. I feel... Uh, invigorated and that's when I get my best ideas. I when can I'm vouch out, for that. I've driven, you pa see I've driven past you um, and walked past you yep. at Portobello. She storms along the prom. Yeah, 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 and I'm see totally there's a lot zone. of thinking <laughs> going on. <laughs> I know, Craig, you probably said hello to me up many times and I'm just continuing to power walk. So that's one of one of my habits. I'm not consistent with it, but I, okay. I, I read, I, you know, when I need it. I, I, I think I'm quite... I like to think I'm I'm aware of what what I need and allowing myself to do that, and that's what I like about being an entrepreneur, being my own boss, is that I can just go. Okay, I need to get out and have a, have a walk and clear my head. Do, sorry, do you do you listen to anything when you're when you're walking? No, like interestingly, or, no. no. I'm I don't listen to a lot of music actually. I occasionally will listen to podcasts and motivational mm -hmm. type. Uh, recordings but mostly I like my own thoughts and I like to be just hearing what's around me mm -hmm. I like to mm -hmm. be present in the moment mm -hmm. versus ha have my well I say in the moment in my own head in the moment mm -hmm. but yeah <laughs> versus listening to something else uh, yeah so that's one of the things that I I do the uh, uh, what works for me when I do it is the making sure I know exactly what I'm doing the following day and then just getting stuck into that to-do list. Uh, I'm not always the best at, at doing that though. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a, quite attracted to bright shiny objects and new things. And <laughs> <laughs> the best lesson I, I, I've, I've learned or I'm still trying to learn is focus. Focus, focus, focus. And that's the, one of the keys, I think. That the people who I see who are moving forward are the people who are very good at focusing. Mm. So. Oh, yeah. So what are some of your favourite books then? Ooh. Favourite books. 
what am I reading at the moment? I'm just thinking, one of my favorites at the moment, actually, <laughs> I'm reading uh, Confidence on Camera by one of my professional speaking association colleagues. And she, it, her, it, it's, it, it's great in terms of helping business people to use video to promote mm. their business and to build their profile and yeah, that sort of thing and so yeah. i've been i had a client come to me actually who had done a video for her business and felt that she wasn't coming through she's a really warm brilliant personality and she was coming across as uh, she was really unhappy with the way that she was coming across it just wasn't her and i said to her this is before I'd even looked at, at Lottie's book, actually. But I said to her, what were you thinking when you, you were being filmed for this? She said, oh, I just wanted to get it over and done with. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> There's the answer. And so anyway, I started looking at, at, at Lottie's book, and that, that's quite, quite a good one for helping people get, get confident and start, start using video in, in their, their world. What else is sitting beside my bed? Seven Habits of Highly Effective High People is, is yeah. beside my bed again. <laughs> So I'll, I'll pick that up every now and again. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm reading, uh, I quite often read the industry magazine. So speaker, there's a speaker magazine that comes out from the National Speakers Association in uh, the States. And I find that really helpful with um, articles on not only how to improve your speaking, but how to improve your speaking business and, and how, how to leverage opportunities and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, uh, so... Yeah, I get lots lots of information from that. Other industry magazines, I, I get People magazine and uh, from the HR kind of mm -hmm. world. Uh, I'm trying to think what else is. I've got a pile of books by my bed at the moment. I can't think what's what's there. Anyway, it's always that's, the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah. Okay, um, what are your main goals at the moment? My main goals at the moment, at the moment, I am very focused on building my speaking business. So the speaking part of my business. So I do a, a lot of coaching and training at the moment. What I do love is being in front of an audience and really sharing my knowledge and, and inspiring people to, to do uh, whatever it is that they, they want to do or need mm. to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at, at building that part of my business at the moment. The other part of my business, I'm in the process of writing a book, Pitchtastic, helping Excellent. people uh, pitch more effectively, whether that's an elevator pitch or pitching for investment or funding or, or whatever. So it's, it's a course that I, I ran previously and I am pulling that together in a book and will be an online course as well when Great. I focus on getting that done. <laughs> are, there, are there any public speakers that you watch and think, you know, they're a fantastic speaker yeah. or any speakers that you would try to emulate? I would never try and emulate someone. I think it's really important to, to find your own style when you're speaking. And I, I, I always encourage people who... Can you who pick characteristics of, yeah. of people? You can see things that work yeah. and I might... I might here's something that I think, oh, that, that phrase really works or that structure yeah, for a presentation yeah. works or I really like how they used the stage in that particular uh, talk. And I do, the, the best speakers for me are the ones where I sit back and I don't take any notes. Mm. I'm just engaged, I'm just listening, yeah, I'm there in the yeah, moment. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of anyone at the, who comes to mind at the moment that where I just have done that recently yeah are there any particular ted talks for instance that that really you know they stick with you yeah well? and probably my favorite ted talks are some of the most popular ones so i think the most read one is the ken robertson, ken robertson one on, on yeah. uh, most watched one sorry mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, on creativity yeah. and there's so many great things about that particular talk is he, he's, he's very humorous and he just really knows how to engage the audience he's very natural and that's his his style. Brené Brown is another one, her um, one on on vulnerability, and that's again, it's she's just natural and and real and vulnerable and mm. all of those things that really appeal and connect with people. Mm -hmm. uh, I I quite often encourage my um, workshop participants and clients to watch the Amy Cuddy 
TED yeah, talk yeah, on yeah. how your body language affects mm-hmm. your confidence and power posing. And <laughs> I, I think there's there's some talk about the fact that maybe that isn't necessarily the whole whole science of it. And, but I I believe in it. It works for me. And it, it's interesting because I've known that since I was quite young in terms of using my body. I didn't realize, I didn't make the connection that the way I was using my body was enhancing my confidence. And I remember at, when I was probably about eight, I was learning to ice skate. And I would, you know, in an ice skating rink, you kind of, you've got the wobbly blades and you, you drag yourself around <laughs> the rink, but you know, hand and you never let go of the side. And I was, I, I was got to the, the opening where you've got to let go and get across to the next bit. And a, a young girl, probably a few years older than me in a really floaty little ice skating outfit, she just kind of came on to the ice rink, did, you know, up in pirouettes and then <laughs> glided off backwards across to the other side. And I just looked and I said, oh, I want to be her. And then I, something clicked in my head and I thought, well, I can't be her if I'm holding on to the side all the time. <laughs> and I just kind of pretended, acted as if I could already ice skate. And I did it. I certainly wasn't as, as graceful as she was, but it allowed me to get past that. And so that whole idea of taking on the the body language posture. and the, the, the yeah, posture and, yeah. and really has a has a massive impact on, mm. on how you feel. It's mm. brilliant. So. Yeah, yeah. There's a Peter Sage quote that I think is absolutely brilliant, which is um, the absolute key to freedom is knowing that you already are that which you seek. And so mm. what he's got this amazing technique where he essentially um, spatially anchors himself to a place. So he's standing here and then he'll say, um, he'll, he'll basically walk to the other side of the room and speak to himself from a future self uh-huh. and say, okay, this is me six months ahead. These are the things that are going to be happening. It's fine. You don't need to worry about it. So he's essentially giving him that, himself that That's confidence. That's a really great technique. Mm. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I think it's, it's mm. absolutely superb. Yeah. Okay. How do you define success? Freedom. Okay, yeah. I think to the freedom to live my life creatively uh, and and abundantly, whatever that is for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it all stems down to freedom for me. I'm not driven by money, I never have been. I'm driven by helping people. I'm driven driven by feeling like I make a difference to people. And yeah, I'm driven by not having any rules or anyone telling me what to do. Mm, yeah. So that's success for yeah. me. If I can be in a position where I am financially free, obviously would be ideal. So then I have the, that freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want, in whatever place I like to, mm. to do it as well. Mm. Yeah. We've heard answers to that a few times now, and not one of them involves money. No. Which is, uh, <laughs> yeah, is yeah, quite the yeah. revelation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect them to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good. So, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Isn't it funny? I'm sitting here with all these pieces of ice going through my head. Yeah, yeah. The best one. Yeah, yeah. What's the best one? Or even a couple of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I think I really value the, the advice that my parents gave me about doing what makes my heart sing, really. And I haven't, mm. haven't been true to that advice all, all my life, but I know when I'm not. And, and things just don't feel like they're flowing in my life. So, yeah, doing do do what what makes you what makes you happy. Play to your strengths, really, because there's no point if you are not playing to your strengths. You you you're not going to get the best out of you. Other people are not going to get the best out of you. And I think we we really need to be conscious of of that and. Some advice that I, I've been given that I am not great at taking is about getting the right people around you in terms of the, a team. I've always been incredibly independent mm. and I find it really challenging to ask for help. 
Mm-hmm. And I noticed that a, a friend of mine set up her business around the same time as I did, and she went into it really very vulnerable and just put her hand up and said, shared with people she was just starting and she was looking for advice and help. And everybody wants to help, and I do too. When If people come to me for advice, absolutely, I'm delighted, I'm flattered that people mm-hmm. would ask. But for me, I really, I struggle to ask for that help. And the more I, the older I get, and certainly the, the, the longer I've been in business, I'm, I realize the importance of, of that and allowing other people to do what they're good at so that you can do what you're good at. But just actually asking, asking for help and advice when you need it is, is key. And why do you think you find that challenging? Oh. <laughs> Well, <laughs> there's a, a bit of a story in my family, and it's it's not true, obviously, but the idea that I the first words that I spoke were me do myself. My mum said I was very independent as a child, and you know if I, she was trying to help me button up my cardigan or something, I'm like no, me do myself, and I don't know why. There's this streak of independence in me, and it is. I think partly it's. It's not wanting to look bad. It's not wanting to fail. It's I was a perfectionist as when I was growing up, I, and I still am to a certain degree. And it's something that I've had to really start to accept. And interestingly, that's probably another piece of advice that someone had given me: that um, done is better than perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I get used to get so hung up on it being perfect that I would spend so much time on things that never. <laughs> Having it we done are is the much perfect better. example of that with Edinburgh Rio. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. It's out there, isn't it? And you're learning as you go yeah, and refining yeah, yeah. it, and and it's done. And people are already having opportunities to experience it, hear hear the interviews that you've done. Yeah, it's it's yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely, classic example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so if you could make a phone call to the twenty year old you, what would you say? Ooh. Believe in yourself. Okay. Is that something you feel that you lacked at that time? Or? I think so. I think that's why I didn't pursue the acting as, as hard as I, I could have, because there was this element of doubt. And I think we are all born with confidence, aren't we? Mm-hmm. We learn doubt. Yeah. <laughs> and it's about unlearning the doubt or not allowing, if you've got children in your life, don't let them learn that doubt. Keep that, that confidence. And... Yeah, we, we, we kind of, we question ourselves too much and I think we are all capable of so much more than, than we think we are. And so that would be my message to myself. It, it just, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get out there and do it. Done is better than perfect. All of those things. But really just believe in, in yourself and your ability because I, I think we allow all sorts of things to hold us back from fulfilling our potential mm. and we don't need to. Yeah. Imagine if we all, the whole world, everyone in the world fulfilled their potential. Wow. What kind of a world would we have then? <laughs> <laughs> I think if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so much of it comes down to confidence as well, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think we need the inner confidence. A lot of people rely on external sources for their confidence and and people um, stroking their egos or building them up. But as I said, we are born confident. We learn the doubt. So our our true essence Mm -hmm. is confident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of just holding on to that and allowing that to guide us. And like I say, I'm not an expert on that part of it in my own <laughs> life because I'm human and I have wobbles like everybody else. But I am. I think the older you get too and the more experience you have, you tend to start to think about, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm okay at, at this thing called life. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. through it okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. That's been absolutely fascinating. A lot, a lot <laughs> of great tips there. Amazing. A lot of great tips to take Thank away. you. It's been an absolute delight yeah. chatting with you. So thank you. No problem at all. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, as you say, a lot of really, really good advice. Uh, fascinating to hear more about, about what you do. And um, thank you so much for, for coming on, Mel. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.